Hello. In the previous video, I told you how Thomson discovered an electron. Now, moving on with that story, Thomson wanted to know the charge and mass of an electron. He knew that electrons are negatively charged particles and that they are present in all uh, atoms, that is of all matter. He again took the cathode ray tube and he carried out this experiment and to find out the charge and mass of an electron. So he took a plate that, is the, that was the cathode, a positive plate that was the anode or two plates. The positive plate had a perforation in it or a hole in it and he connected it to a battery and since the anode was connected to the positive electrode therefore it was called the anode and the negatively charged electrode was the cathode. And when cathode rays were produced on passing 10,000 volts of electric current, he found according to their nature, the cathode rays should have traveled straight. And if this was a fluorescent screen at the end of the tube, the screen would get illuminated at point B. Now, what did he do? He had also learned that when you subject the uh, cathode ray to an electric field, the cathode ray deviates towards the positive plate or towards the positively charged uh, electric field, which means that cathode rays are negatively charged. And when you use a magnetic field, they deviate towards the other direction, which is as expected of the negatively charged rays. So what these would be the points if it was an electric field, the ray would move towards A and if it was a magnetic field, the ray would de deviate towards C. So these were the results that he got when he used no, uh, no field, it would be B. In the presence of electric field, the ray would travel towards A and in the presence of a magnetic field, the ray would travel towards C. So what did he do? He used both the fields together and when he did that, both were were countering each other's effects. If the electric field was pushing the ray towards the upside, towards A, the magnetic field was pulling it down towards C. So what did he do? He started, he started manipulating the voltage of these uh, plates and the strength of the magnet. And as he changed those, he started arranging both of those in such a way that finally he could strike a balance and the cathode ray would neither be deviated towards A nor be deviated towards C, but would rather come and fall exactly at B as if there was no electric or magnetic field affecting it. Once he achieved that kind of a balance, he realized that these deflections, what do they depend on? He said that the deflection depends on the magnitude of the charge, that how much is the charge of the electrons of the cathode ray, the particles, if the charge is higher, that is it's a higher negative charge, obviously the deviation would be greater. And if the charge is lesser, the deviation would be lesser. It inversely depended on the mass, which means that if the mass of the particles, uh, the gas taken and the particles was larger, then the deviation would be less. It's like someone who's fat like me and has to move, finds it difficult to move. While if there's someone light next to me and I just give a little shove, he would move faster and maybe even fall down. So when the particles are a little light, they, the deviation is more because they move faster. Then the third thing that the deflection of the cathode ray depended on was the voltage. If you increase the voltage, then obviously the field, the voltage of the electric field or the magnetic field, then obviously if you bring a strong magnet to a small piece of nail, the nail would just go and get stuck to the magnet. But if you've got a weak magnet to the same nail, the magnet would move slowly towards, uh, sorry, the nail would move slowly towards the magnet. So these were the factors which decided the deflection of the cathode ray. But based on this balance of both the uh, electric and magnetic fields and balancing the cathode ray at B, he was able to arrive, he for, I mean, substituted these, uh, his observations in certain equations and was able to calculate the charge over mass ratio of an electron, where E is the charge of the electron 
and mass of the electron is Me and he could find out the charge over mass ratio of an electron was 1.76 into 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kg. But this was neither the charge nor was it the mass of the electron. Do you see it was only a ratio between the charge and the mass but this happened in 1897 and for a few years then this is the only knowledge that scientists had that was the charge over mass ratio but they did not know the charge or the mass of an electron specifically. Now in 1913 a scientist called Millikan he carried out an experiment and his friend Harvey Fletcher they carried out an experiment which was known as which is popularly known as the Millikan's oil drop experiment. Now when they did this experiment they were able to calculate the mass and the charge of an electron. Let us see what did Millikan do in his oil drop experiment. He took a, a, a cylinder let us assume that this uh, can of candy is like this is what it was like and I'm showing you a cross section of this apparatus. Okay, so if there's a cross section of this, what was there in the apparatus that he took? He had a chamber and in this apparatus, he had a, an atomizer. An atomizer was somewhat like, uh, you could say a spray bottle. Do you see this? You can spray. So this would spray a mist and this atomizer could spray a mist of not water this has got water in it but he had he had oil in the atomizer it was like an old age you know uh, perfume bottle where he could pump it and a mist would come out so he took a chamber and he in this he had an atomizer and this entire apparatus he the entire chamber he put two plates in it metallic plates it was somewhat like, you know, this cylindrical substance having a metallic plate here and a metallic plate in the, at the bottom. These metallic, why were they metallic? Because he wanted to pass electric current through it. So these metallic plates he, he placed inside the chamber and above the plate, the first plate, above the first plate was the atomizer or the spray. And this upper plate, it had a hole in the center. The upper plate had a hole in the center and therefore this allowed whatever, the, if there was a circular disc here, the plate and the atomizer was spraying the droplets of not water but oil. So he started spraying oil into this chamber. That's why it's known as the oil drop experiment. So these little droplets of oil, they spread into the upper chamber and through the hole they would fall down. Why would they fall down? Due to gravity everything falls downwards and gravity pulls a thing downwards. So gravity made the drops come down into the lower chamber. Now the lower chamber had two metallic plates and these plates were connected to a source of electric current and the source of electric current was was such whose voltage could be controlled. So it was a source of current whose voltage could be controlled and therefore he put this, I mean the source of electric current was put here and the two plates were connected. There was this little place, this opening which allowed light to come into the chamber, which allowed light so that you could see what was going on inside the chamber. And on the other side, there was a hole in which a microscope or a telescope had been fixed for the for Millikan to look into the uh, into the chamber. And in addition to this, there was one more source, one more uh, opening through which an ionizing radiation could be could, was penetrating the chamber. This ionizing radiation was supposed to ionize the gas present inside the air present inside the chamber. And this ionized gas would give out electrons and these electrons would go and stick over the oil drops. So these electrons could go and stick over the oil drops and then the oil drops now coated with the electrons were moving downwards towards the ground that is towards the ground because of gravity. Now what did Millikan do? 
what was all this apparatus set up for? He, as he was looking through the microscope, he carefully started noticing the movement of a single drop. Like he focused on one drop at a time and he started observing as it came down. Now, he turned on the electric current. And while the electric current was turned on, what would you expect from the drops? The drops were coming down due to gravity, but the drops, drops which had gained electrons from the gases present, the electrons given out by the gas present in the chamber, was now, each droplet was negatively charged due to the gain of electrons. Since these drops were negatively charged and they were falling downwards, what was expected? As you passed electric current through it, the lower plate was negatively charged and the upper plate was positively charged. So this charged droplet, it would move, where would it move? It would move upwards, why? Because it is negatively charged and like charges repel each other while opposite charges attract each other. So the expected effect was that as you turned on the electric current, the negatively charged bottom plate repelled the droplet upwards and the positively charged plate pulled it upwards towards itself while at the same time gravity was moving downwards. Now as the drops were falling down there were two forces acting on the drops. Let us assume that this is an oil drop coming down. So as the drop moved downwards it was gravity that was pulling it downwards and the electric field which was being applied, that was the negative charge of the electric uh, of the lower plate was pushing the drop upwards while the positive plate was attracting it towards itself. Therefore, there were two forces acting on the drop. The gravity pushing it downwards and the electric field pushing it upwards. Now, it was like a tug of war. There were two opposing forces pulling the drop in two directions, that is upwards and downwards. When this happened, the force that one would decide where the drop would go. Slowly, since he had this dial that he could move and he could adjust the voltage, gravity cannot be changed, it's constant. So he started adjusting the voltage. And he's, when he adjusted the voltage, he started increasing the voltage in such a way that the drop that was falling down, the one that he was observing, as it came down, it was being pushed by an equal force upwards. If he increased the dial just a little bit slightly, the drop would be pushed upwards. And if he decreased the voltage, the drop would go downwards. And slowly, as he very carefully adjusted the dial, he reached a voltage where the drop that was coming down and going up was doing it ever so slightly to a point where it became kind of stationary. Now when it was stationary, the force of gravity is known to us. There was a way how he calculated the mass of the drop and after calculating the mass of the drop, he what is the force of gravity? It is the mass into acceleration due to gravity. He could find out the mass of, the, of each drop that he observed because he carried out this experiment multiple times with many drops. And the droplets were not the same size, remember, and they had not gained the same number of electrons too. So when he made the drop became stationary, he calculated the voltage, he knew the voltage that was required to stop the free fall and what did he calculate? He calculated the masses of the drops from their radii and from their density, he could calculate the masses of each of the droplets that he observed and he carried out the experiment multiple times and he was able to find out the charge on each drop. He was able to calculate the charge on each drop. How did he do that? These were, let us assume that these were his multiple. Uh, these have been a little, they are a little different from the actual readings. And these were the readings that he got. The mass of each droplet, so let us say, was 5.9, 4.2, 3.7, 9.8, 6.2, 3.3. .3. These were his uh, masses that he was getting. And the voltage that he got each time to make this 
droplet stationary, he took down those readings too. And he now knew that force of gravity and force of electricity were equal to make the drop stationary. Force of gravity is mass into acceleration due to gravity and force of electricity should have been equal to the voltage of electric current and the charge on the electron or charge on the drop because he was not taking single electrons. The charge on the drop. The charge on the drop was Q and E was the electric current that is the volts of electric current that he was using. So when he got these readings, multiple readings, he started studying these and when he calculated the charge for the, uh, for the droplets, he found that each time he got for this, he got the result was 160 zepto coulombs, which is a very, very small charge. So 160 zepto coulombs was the charge of one, uh, one of the droplets. And for all of these, these were the readings that he got. 160, 320, 480, 640, 800 and then he noticed something very striking. All these droplets, they were nothing, all these charges that he was calculating were all multiples of 160. Let us assume that the charge of 160 septo coulombs and that was the smallest charge that he could get. Let us assume that in his readings, he never got the 160, that small, any droplet having just one electron and that the charge was much larger. So he found out the lowest common multiple for all these readings of the charges that he got and he found that these charges were multiples of 160 zepto coulombs. He said, if this is the smallest possible charge and all the droplets have the same charge, it means that this particular droplet may have gained only one electron, this may have gained two electrons, this may have gained three electrons and therefore the charges were multiples of one another. So from this he calculated what is 160 zepto coulombs, he said is the charge of one electron and 160 zepto coulombs in coulombs would be 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs was the charge on one electron, which could be 0 0.0000160 coulombs. So that was a very, very small charge on an electron. And looking at this, we can see that it was, since it was an electron, this charge had to be negative charge. So what is the charge on an electron? It is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs, but you put a negative here where the negative means it's negative charge. It's not numerically minus, it is a negative charge. So it has 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs of negative charge. Now, he knew the charge of an electron. The next step was to find out the mass of an electron. So he went back to Thomson's work. Thomson had found out the charge over mass ratio, while Millikan in his oil drop experiment had calculated the charge on an electron. So we could make an equation from this. And charge over mass should be equal to charge over mass. So this should be equal to this over mass. So he did this. One point 76 into 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kg should be equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs over the mass of an electron. So what should mass of an electron be? Mass of electron should be 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs upon 1.76 into 10 to the power 11 coulombs per kg which would be equal to this comes to be equal to 9.1 into 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kgs. So this was the mass of an electron, which was calculated by substituting this value in by preparing this equation using Thomson's equation of charge and mass ratio. So that's how the charge and mass of an electron were discovered. So now we move to the discovery of the nucleus. That is, in the next video, we'll do the Rutherford experiment.
Thank you for watching.